Hi there, thanks for your enrollment. We are in one minute ad break. In this break, I'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount. Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses, you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses and study well. All the best. Thanks everyone for subscribing my YouTube channel. This course is related to CCNA Wireless. I just wanted to show you that from where you can go and get the docs. So first of all, you have to come to giganetworkers.in. That's the blog site. Once you reach there, then you can see that we have one tab specifically for CCNA. You can go to CCNA and then you can go to CCNA Wireless. Once you click to CCNA Wireless, then you will reach to the doc link, document link. Obviously, when you watch the video, you have those videos, but you want to create your own document. So you can go and check the document link. And in the videos, all these slides are explained properly. So you can go and create your own notes. You can see it's total number of slides, 338. It's a big document. Even CCNA security is a, is a good course in terms of if you are a beginner in wireless technology, so you can go and explore more and more uh, to this particular course and learn wireless related stuffs. That will help you obviously to enhance your career in your wireless technology. Correct. So I wish all the best for this course. Please go watch complete video, make your notes and prepare well for your exams. Hi everyone. Welcome to Wireless Basics CCNA level course. In this course, we are going to understand and learn about basics of wireless technology. That is what is RF, what is signal to noise, what is channel, what is antenna, what are different type of wireless protocols. And then finally, uh, we have few video related to basic wireless security, how wireless security works. So I hope that you learn this CCNA level wireless technology and that will be a good point for you to start your wireless career. Thank you. Six of wireless. Now wireless is very different than wired technology. We know that in wired technology, you have routers, you have switches, you have cables, modem, uh, endpoint systems where you have the NIC card, you are connecting the interfaces and uh, this is the way that network infra built. Apart from that, wireless technology is uh, free from media. Uh, that is not 100% true, free from media. It's still in wireless technology, you have air as a media, or you have uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, transport, but not the physical transport. So maybe air, maybe wire, inside wire also uh, the uh, wireless waves uh, can go from one place to other place but that is again uh, uh, not the exact use case we have we'll see later on in this course that we have different type of frequency range range of different type of wavelength for different different uh, wireless frequency and which particular range we are going to use in the uh, lan so it's actually broad thing and in that broad, we are using uh, one small spectrum or one small slice of that wavelength 
for our wireless networking or for our wireless use. So let's start with a very basic and then slowly we'll add um, things in this. Uh, we'll add some more and more uh, concept in this. So here you can see in the diagram that you have sender, you have receiver. That's the uh, normal way of communication. So if there is receiver, if there is sender, if they are connected, then only the communication will happen, correct? Now in case of wireless, here it is showing that you have a rope in between sender and receiver, but you have invisible media, say for, in, for example in wireless, but you have the uh, waves. So for example, I'll use the term wave. So here you can see that you have the electric and magnetic field in the diagram. You have E and M and they are propagating uh, inside the uh, air. So air is the media where it is propagating. Now, if this wave is not constant, so suppose you start one pulse and stop, so that will not reach to the receiver. So that means your wave should be cons uh, should be constant. So it should have constant height and down. So here you can see uh, you have up and down that means the flow of the wave you should have to reach to the destination. Uh, so at this point of time with this slide you'll understand okay um, we have media air and then we have the wave uh, that construction of wave is with electric and magnetic. So we have electromagnetic wave. Now again, you can see that you have one sort one sender who will send and then you have a receiver who will receive. So at this point of time, I assume that everyone knows that we have the access point. We know that you have access point nowadays in all the networks. So you have access point who will send the wireless uh, say waves and then you have, for example, you have laptop where you have the receiver so he is receiving and the access point who is sending okay so in that the communication will happen uh, your receiver should have capability to receive and uh, the sender now the sender can send in all the direction later on we'll study about antennas and all and we'll see that what uh, what is the use case of the direction of sending the frequencies or sending the uh, wavelength or sending the uh, signals okay so you have sender you have receiver all right then what is frequency frequency is the up and down cycle in one second okay so let me show you the definition i have taken the definition as well uh, so here you can see that <clears throat> frequency the number of times the signal makes one complete up and down cycle so when you go up and down in one second, so suppose if uh, you are making four up and down in one second, so that's uh, one second your frequency is four hertz. Now again, what is hertz? Obviously uh, hertz, uh, this is one of the scientists who has done research and uh, developed or uh, given his thesis and paper uh, related to electromagnetic wave and wrote so many books. All right, so hertz, is the most commonly used frequency unit and is nothing uh, other than one cycle per second. So now you are sending the wave. Remember, you have rope and you are sending. So you are sending the wave and in one second, how many up and down you have, that is one hertz. And suppose if we have thousand or if you have uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands etc or thousands of thousands so that will be determined as a hertz kilohertz megahertz and gigahertz uh, we are very much specific about gigahertz in our wireless uh, lan network that will go and discuss so now this is the thing I, I told you that we have wide range of a spectrum. So we have cosmic rays, gamma rays, X-rays. We know that some of uh, things are coming from uh, sun. Some of the rays are spread in the space. Some of the rays we are using for medical healthcare as well. Ultraviolet light, microwaves, uh, we know all these things. But what we are going to use, we are going to use, here you can see, in terms of gigahertz. So if you see the spectrum is starting from zero, I am focusing upon or I'm focusing here. Let me focus the spotlight. One gig to 10 gig. 
okay so 1 gig to 10 gig slice that we have so in that we have 2.4 gig wireless and 5 gigahertz wireless and then again you have the bands for that so we are going to focus on these uh, spectrum and these frequency actually we are going to use inside our wireless network okay so for example for 5 gigahertz you can see it's starting with 515 and going to 5.825 remember this is in gigahertz now if you convert this into mega so that means that 100,000 mega hurt and let make this easy so um, say for example you have 10 then 10 3 then 10 6 and let me make this as 10 9 if I'm not wrong so 10 6 is your mega 10 3 is your kilo so this is a kilo this is your mega and this is your gigahertz okay now suppose this is the range you have so for example 5.15 to 5.250 so what is the difference so difference is actually 100.100 gigahertz and now if you convert this into meg so what will happen uh, maybe one megahertz because then I, you have to multiply this with one two and three so that means I think 10 megahertz 10 megahertz is 0.1 gigahertz correct all right so that's the difference of 10 actually we have uh, so everywhere you will see that uh, here you have 10 meg uh, difference again if you go and see this so 0.100 10 megahertz etc etc means that's the uh, band we have let me show you in the next slide we have some examples related to that so here you can see that all these spectrum range that it is shown here uh, and the same thing there's a difference in between the spectrum and that is defined as a channel so suppose for this particular range that is 2.4 gigahertz uh, starting with 2.412 gigahertz uh, reaching to 2.484 gigahertz we have 14 channels now for one channel what will be the difference so this difference will be say for example 2.417 although it uh, looks very small but the value is big 412 that is 500 this is in gigahertz that means that you have five megahertz so again if you multiply with thousand you will get five megahertz okay so these are the calculation we should know uh, again it's uh, very much mathematical and uh, little bit physics is also involved so what about the channels here you can see the channels and the difference in between that hi there thanks for your enrollment we are in one minute ad break in this break, I'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount. Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses you are going to get heavy discount up to 95 percent you can see the prices are a uh, little bit higher here but if you go and apply the coupon the prices will go rock bottom so go use those coupons suppose if you don't have those coupons then you can always uh, ping me over youtube you can send me email you can ask for those coupons i will provide you that coupon so get the coupon get the discount some of my courses over udemy they are bestseller some of the courses are quite new like stvan automation dna automation a cci data center 3.0 those are the new uploads as well so please go continue your learning take the coupon enroll my courses and study well all the best uh, let's continue 
so here you can see that you have 14 channel and in, in between that gap is 5 megahertz. Now again, uh, if you see the overlapping and non overlapping channel, you'll find that there is one condition. So if the signal bandwidth less than or it should be less than the channel width. So here you can see the signal bandwidth and the channel width. If signal bandwidth is less, there is no overlapping but if you can see that signal bandwidth is more than the channel so in between one two three four you have a small channel width so in that case you have the overlapping okay so these things should be considered again what's the concept of phase phase means how much shift there in the actual cycle so suppose uh, in the first diagram you can see that there is zero percent shift or zero degree of shift so that's how the two line is showing uh, in parallel but suppose if you have shift of 30 degree or 60 degree or 180 degree then you can uh, check the phase shift okay so again these are purely uh, terms related to physics uh, some sort of electric uh, electrical and magnetic signals again we are studying in the networking all right so what are the terms that we are going to use more and more and more so you will find that frequency the hertz then the uh, wavelength then the channel width etc so one of the key term we have is the wavelength now what is the wavelength wavelength is the length for one cycle so the wavelength measured uh, of the physical distance that a, a wave travel over a complete cycle and that will be represented by lambda so lambda uh, define the wavelength for 2.4 gigahertz uh, signal the wavelength is 4.92 inch for 5 gigahertz signal the wavelength is 2.36 okay so again this is the mathematical calculation the length uh, for one a cycle that's the wavelength likewise how we are going to measure the uh, power so here you can see that uh, rf power uh, and that is in db decibel if you see the diagram you'll find that the power is defined or this amplitude is defined in between two uh, peakest two peak one is in the positive direction for example one is in the negative direction so the maximum length in between two peak that will give you the amplitude and this amplitude we are going to measure or it will be measured in either watts or milliwatt so again you can see a new term and uh, terms are coming more and more so when power is measured in what uh, watts or milliwatts it is considered to be absolute uh, measure again we have one mathematical formula we are going to discuss about that but the important thing here is that for wireless LAN the power will lie in between 100 um, milliwatt to 1 milliwatt and if you convert in watt that is 1.1 watt to 0.001 watt so better will go and measure in milliwatt so power will be in between 100, 100 to 1 milliwatt for wireless LAN but for other services you can see that for uh, AM radio station broadcast this is uh, 50,000 watt so you can see how much power it is uh, so for example 16,000 watt for FM radio this is huge uh, uh, power correct all right so let's focus only on the LAN side on the wireless LAN side and let's try to understand the mathematics behind that so suppose if we have three transmitter transmitter one two three in the diagram below and you want to check the relative power between uh, one two three so you can see now we have one mathematics better uh, we'll go and check the mathematical formula so what will be the power difference between t1 t2 t3 for that it it will be measured in decibel and decibel is a mathematical formula in the uh, logarithmic function now if you just uh, completed your uh, graduation in mathematics or bca or uh, maybe engineering and then it's very easy and convenient convenient for you to check this formula in db so when we have say 
10 base 10 uh, p2 by p1 that means that this is 10 log 10 p2 actually divide means p2 minus p1 so you can think like this it's not the exact say 10 I, I can take 10 as outside because 10 is common so this means log 10 p2 minus log 10 p1 and suppose if we have some formula uh, so for example p1 into p2 so that means plus that's the log function we have suppose if you have formula something like this log p2 into p1 so that means we can take 10 outside this means log 10 p2 plus log uh, log 10 p1 okay and absolute means that either it's a plus and minus we are taking the uh, magnitude of that or the uh, module of that all right so now let's try to understand i'll come back and resolve this that if we have power 1 and power 10 so what will be the difference now we are not going to do uh, the difference of power rather than uh, what we can do that will go and measure the db okay so db means uh, so for example t2 by t1 and then you have log 10 and then you have 10 that means that will be 10 log 10 to the 10 that means this will be 1 as per mathematics so the difference is 10 okay i'll come back to this we'll discuss more on this later on after one or two slides so let me go and complete the slides first so then we have three different law law for zero suppose uh, if we have same power so the relative power difference will, will be zero because if for example 10 by 10 will give you one and log 10 um, this is the base so one base 10 is zero suppose what is the law of three suppose if you have a difference of two so if you are getting the value log 10 base 2 this that will be 3 db and if we if we have 1 by 2 minus 3 db okay so what does it mean it means suppose 10 by 5 and log 10 and again you have 10 that means you have 10 10 base 10 and this will be log 10 2 here finally it will come to 3 db uh, this is again the formula uh, no need to mug up at this point of time but if you want you can take the reference you can check any um, any mathematical book related to uh, related to decibel okay all right so say what is happening actually here so this what at this point of time we can mark this thing that this value is 3 okay and 1 by 2 means minus so this value will be minus 3 later in this same section after one slide i'll discuss more about that then we have law of 10 what does it mean so if we have 10 base 10 that will be 1 okay so 1 into 10 obviously 10 1 by 10 means minus so then you have minus 10 okay great so now we understand the law of 0 law of 3 and law of 10 Let's try to solve some of the questions. So here you can see, first of all, we have the summary table. So if difference is two, then uh, the power difference will be three dB. If it is one by two, minus three, into 10 plus 10 dB, divided by 10 minus 10 dB. But again, what does it mean? So from this example, it will be 100% clear. So you can see in the bottom, that a b and c their power consumption in milliwatt for 8 and 16 now b is how much more than a plus okay so let's try to understand now if you go and do b by a you will find 8 by 4 that will be 2 as per the uh, formula we know that log 10 2 is 3 db correct 
so that means b is equal to a plus 3 db now what will be c so c again uh, you can see 16 by 8 that means 2 c will be b plus 3 db and what is b b is a plus 3 db plus 3 db that means a plus 6 db okay so this is the way that we can go and calculate now you can think that oh it's a very easy example if i have some complex calculation so for example in this exam uh, diagram you can see that you have 5 and 200 okay so how i can resolve this 5 and 200 so what we can do in this that um, you can go and check sorry you can go and check like 200 and divided by 5 so that will be how much uh, 40 now this 40 will be and the calculation will be um, 2 into 2 into 10 correct so 2 means 3 db plus 3 db plus 10 db correct uh, so that means that uh, e equal to uh, 6 plus 10 so e equal to d plus 16 db so little bit of mathematical calculation if you do then you can go and check the relative power between two of the transmitters or two of the antenna all right so these basic knowledge are required when we are going and we are going to learn some uh, other wireless technology so what is db what is hertz what is amplitude what is wavelength etc all right so we have three modulation technique uh, that that will come under three spectrum so we have fhss frequency hopping spread spectrum dsss direct sequence spread uh, spectrum and oftm orthogonal frequency division multiplexing now you can see that name itself is big and we are going to discuss about ex ex exactly where they fit in the wireless LAN and which standard match which particular spectrum correct so if you go and check the technical detail like the physics and the uh, electronics behind that you'll find that there are so many things to understand to understand one spectrum so behind the scene it's a uh, complex mathematical and physical structure uh, so those things we are taking inside our uh, digital world in our uh, networking world and we are using it so let's see that what exactly we are using although everyone most of the engineers are using wireless uh, technology but we are not aware that behind the scene which particular spectrum or the modulation technology we are using with which particular uh, standard ITPLA standard so first of all we have the FHSS that is the early ones means uh, with the evolution or with the beginning of wireless LAN technology we have this uh, methodology we have this modulation technique uh, we have this uh, a spectrum so here you can see that it has a 79 channel and uh, you have problem as well and we have some benefit as well so what is the problem here you can see that the frequency hopping will follow this rule so channel 2 will move to 25 then 64 then 10 then 45 like that it will jump now here in the diagram you can see that first of all it is uh, supporting uh, 2.4 gigahertz a spectrum and then you can see in the diagram that 2 then it is going to 25 then 45 then 64 returning back to 10 and vice versa now what is the problem the problem here is that they are limited to 1 or 2 mbps speed okay that's one of the big problem because nowadays we are looking for a speed uh, and this is one of the biggest problem now what is good thing is that uh, whenever we are talking about uh, first evolved technology it's actually easy to set up and use etc now all other technologies modulation technologies are also easy to set up and use but behind the scene the uh, circuit the chip 
the coder, encoder, etc. It's a little bit complex and because it is evolved uh, from one technology to other technology. So what is the solution? So then we have the next uh, uh, approach, a spectrum approach, that is a DSSS, direct uh, sequence spread X spectrum. Uh, it can give you higher throughput. So for example, we have one summary slide by the end of this uh, uh, slide, so we'll see that. So it is going to give you, say for example, 11 Mbps of a speed, that is still not enough, correct? And this is also falling into 2.4 gigahertz band so here you can see fhss and dsss both are falling in the same spectrum band uh, their uh, speed overall throughput is although 11 mbps is good but it's still nowadays we are working in digital workplace and all still it's less the other disadvantage it has that because their channels are overlapping so they have only three non-overlapping channel channel one 6 and 11. Now what is the technology behind? So let's try to understand. Here you can see this technology, uh, this diagram that how the bits are coming, they are getting coded, means they are getting arranged. Again, they are getting packed inside the block and then uh, it is uh, it is getting modulated and then it is um, going outside as a signal. So how it is? So first of all, we have this scrambler what it is doing the data waiting to be sent in first a scrambler means whenever any request is coming it's up to a scrambler uh, it will do some uh, a scrambling and then uh, how the data will go now next is the coder and it's important what coder is doing that they are converting data into multiple bits so coder use is to convert the data whatever it is coming from the scrambler so here you can see that data is um, data bit is coming and then coder is converting that data into multiple bits each of new coded bits are called a chip so here you can see in the diagram uh, all these bits are called as a chip now here uh, we have uh, dsss uses two encoding technology so maybe somewhere you have seen this uh, short form. We have Barker codes and we have complementary code keying CCK. That's a coding methodology. Now next we have the interleaver. What interleaver is doing? Again, it's important that whatever uh, input you are getting, so obviously the data bits that you are getting from coder, uh, the interleaver will spread this into separate block. So you have data, then you have bit, bit, and then you have block. Data, bit, block. Finally, we have the modulation. Once the modulation will happen, then it will flow in the air as a RF signal. Okay. Now, more or less, the DSSS and the next technology that is the OFDM, both are using same technology behind the scene. But in OFDM, you can think that you have parallel processing. So suppose that DSSS or DSSS, that they have this uh, modulation technique for one stream of data. Now, if you do 64 parallel processing or for example, 48 plus four parallel processing, obviously your overall throughput will increase. So now suppose if you have 11 Mbps, you can multiply 11 Mbps by say for example 52. So that much throughput you can get in terms of Mbps. So next technology we have uh, because we still we are looking for higher throughput and speed. So we have the OFDM uh, modulation technique. What OFDM is doing uh, that it helps in parallel processing. That's the main thing. Uh, so here you can see that in contrast with OFDM sends data bits in parallel, that's the key, over multiple frequencies, all contained in a single 20 megahertz channel. Now there are technology, so they have guard for 12 uh, subcategory, pilot for uh, four subcategory and data for 48 subcategory. Now guard will be there, but this pilot and 48 uh, subcategory for data is going to be used and you can think that you have that much parallel uh, processing or that much uh, parallel um, signals 
uh, in a row you have so here you can see that you have 48 subcategory and that's huge correct great so now sometimes you might see that OFTM and again these are the uh, theoretical things having 52 subcategories 48 for data and 4 for palette uh, this is because 12 guard frequencies are not actually transmitted but they are silent in the channel spacing so that's why we have the uh, modulation for each uh, data into 52 times so you have 52 times subcategory now let me go and show in the diagram so here you can see in the diagram that you have coded data then you have 48 subcategory and inside subcategory you can see and then you have the channel so you have 20 megahertz channel and it is a spread across uh, 48 subcategory now OFTM obviously they have to use a scrambling uh, coding interleaving and modulation but for all subcategory and that's why it's a parallel processing so whatever we have studied in DSSSS the same thing is happening say for example 48 times parallelly okay we have I typically a standard uh, so let's see that what a standard we have uh, first of all this 802.11 was introduced on 1997 and then after two year 802.11b has been introduced uh, here you can see that it is supporting 2.4 gigahertz band the modulation is d triple s and the data rate support is up to 11 mbps now 11 mbps is not a big speed nowadays in the digital world so that's why we need some higher throughput so next we have 802.11g where they are also in the band of 2.4 gigahertz but here you can see that the data rate uh, start from 6 mbps going to 54 mbps so it is giving much more throughput with compared to 802.11b introduced was introduced in 2003 now it's still the problem here in this uh, 802.11g here you can see that although you have the bands different bands so uh, we have a note here that g and b use complete different transmission types one is using dsss one is using ofdm and uh, these technical details we have discussed in the previous section so that means the devices who are supporting these uh, transmission types they will not communicate because they have uh, the different uh, communication channel they have different signals okay and the other thing that uh, they have very less non overlapping channel as well so that's why uh, we have 802.11a although this will also support 54 mbps but it is using different uh, channel uh, it is using actually different band 5 gig hard band but it has long uh, range of non overlapping channels so here you can see that band is different for 802.11a that is 5 gig band and they speed from 6 mbps up to 54 mbps now at this at this point of time is still we can see that 54 mbps is not that digital workplace actually looking for because now we have say 100 of mbps of lan speed we need fast throughput we have different type of uh, devices in the workplace we have iot based devices we have so many mobile devices we we need fast speed so that's the evolution or the introduce uh, introduction of 802.11n uh, that is supporting 600 mbps that is the theoretical maximum but it is supporting a huge uh, bandwidth the data rate is huge and they also have uh, very much non overlapping uh, channels the good thing about 802.11n is that uh, here you can see in the summary that they are supporting uh, both the band 2.4 and 5 so in this list you can see that 1997 we have 802.11 uh, where we have both uh, DSSS and FHSS we have a study about this in our previous section the speed was 2 mbps after two year 11.b came into the picture whose modulation is D 
uh, triple S which is supporting 11 Mbps then we have 11 a which is using OFTM 54 Mbps but you can see the band is different so 11 a and 11 G you can see the band is different but they can have the same modulation technique and their overall throughput is 54 Mbps now again in 2009 we have a uh, 802.11n where they are supporting both the bands their bandwidth you can see their modulation is OFTM but the throughput can be theoretically 600 mbps all right so let's just stop here hi there thanks for your enrollment we are in one minute ad break in this break i'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy and if you are going to enroll my courses you will get 95% discount every month three times first week mid of the month and the last week of the month I am sharing the coupons if you go and use those coupons then my courses related to CCNP related to CCI all those courses you are going to get heavy discount up to 95 percent you can see the prices are a uh, little bit higher here but if you go and apply the coupon the prices will go rock bottom so go use those coupons suppose if you don't have those coupons then you can always uh, ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses and study well. All the best. Next topic we have interference and effect of physical object. Now interference is nothing but the noise. And this noise, that means that you are sending some signal and it has some overlap. Now here you can see that overlap maybe uh, with the same channel. So different transmitter having same channel and they are overlapping. Now in real world, this co-channel interference is often a uh, necessary evil it's just too bad it means your signal will get degraded as much as so uh, we should plan it we should put the access point in a proper manner so there should be less uh, interference or no interference now that's the one thing uh, so here you can see that two uh, nearby transmitter should never be placed in the same channel because there is strong signal would be more likely to interface that's the one case the second case we have that if we have the neighboring uh, channel interference so what is happening that now i have transmitter a with channel 6 and transmitter b with channel 7 and they have the overlap even in the 5 gigahertz band still we know that it has long list of uh, channels means it's uh, it has so many different channels that uh, the way or the chances that they can overlap is less is still the best practice suggests that you should uh, avoid placing ne a neighboring access point on uh, nearby even it is a 5 gigahertz so if you think that is still there is less chance of doing the interference but still we should plan the placement of the access point in a way that they should not object or interference uh, the signal of each each neighboring uh, access point or the uh, channels or bands all right next topic we have uh, the effect of physical object so what what is happening say you place your access point and then it is in contact with the surface who is reflecting the wave it's very much like uh, light we know that uh, how the light wave are reacting if you put light wave in front of mirror and if you put that in a certain angle it will reflect even if your surface is smooth uh, in that case the uh, signals rf signals will also uh, reflected or get uh, reflect now you can see in this diagram that okay there may be chance that the receiver is 
MIMO multiple input multiple output so here you can see in the diagram that the sender is sending the signal with three different direction and receiver because he know that how to get from the multipath he can get it still this situation is okay but suppose if you have single uh, uh, radio chain or the receiver has only single uh, radio chain capability means they can take the signal just from one source so in that case it will become worse obviously you can see the uh, signal will get degraded say in case of a and c if we have one a b c like that okay so second thing we have the ab uh, absorption uh, what will happen in uh, absorption is that uh, this signal will get reduced so you have some dense media and behind that dense media you have put your uh, access point so in that case the signal will get reduced and we should not uh, place our access point in a way that it will get uh, reduced then we have the scattering if you have some sharp surface so at that point of time if the signal will land it will get reflected obviously the distortion of the signal will be there then we have refraction refraction means that again the, your signal will get distracted the actual physical meaning or if you go and check the physics book you'll find that uh, when rf signal meet the boundary between media of two different density so if one place you have higher density other place you have some lower density say for example um, air and water so air has low density water has higher density and if the signal will travel on those media obviously it will get uh, refracted okay so these are the evils we have here you can see that uh, you have reflection you have absorption you have a scattering a refraction and then finally we have the diffraction as well so suppose on a line of signal if you have some opaque or if you have some void in between that so in that case the signal will get distorted it will get refracted diffracted so suppose an rf signal approaches an opaque object or uh, one that is able to absorb the energy so that's the case you have the diffraction obviously uh, the signal will get degraded one of the important concept we have in this is the frangel zone what is this frangel zone before going to that you can see uh, the one of the example of uh, diffraction that uh, you have the obstacle you are sending the media uh, you are sending the uh, frequency the uh, waves and you have the media in between who is diffracting the signals obviously the signal is getting diffracted that's the one thing so what is the solution for that that uh, you can use a uh, line of sight wireless signal so two big towers in between that there is nothing so there is nothing means there is no um, object or uh, abstraction in between that so here you can see you don't have big tower in between that in between two buildings so your signal can uh, transmit it from here receive from here that is one of the solution but again what uh, frenzel law is telling is uh, according to frenzel the rule is even a narrow line of sight signal can be uh, affected by diffraction even if an object does not directly block the signal there is elliptical shaped volume around the line of sight that must also remain free of obstruction so what is mean and that's called the friend uh, you you can see here that i have transmitter and receiver in the diagram but when you send the light or when you send the signal not light but our radio frequency uh, signal so when you send the radio waves at that time what will happen that it will create some sort of cylindrical volume across it because still you have air in between still you have the gravitational force still you have some uh, invisible uh, you can say obstruction in between that maybe in some places we have um, so much pollution so maybe the heavy particle they can um, collide and there are so many factors for that so in that case what will happen they will form this cylindrical type of uh, structure in between that again you can see that you have a small building in between that so it still is going to 
degrade the quality of signal okay and then you can see that uh, this curve is showing that you should not have uh, the anything any obstruction in this curve and that's again coming from one of the uh, formula okay so these are the things related to the uh, interference and related to the uh, objects physical objects in between and again if you go and check more and more about the reflection refraction absorption and all these things very much taken from the uh, physics um, we have learned a lot uh, in our maybe 12th or in our graduation about all these theorems and theory related to uh, various uh, diffraction and the transmission of uh, signals all right so let's stop here next basic topic we have is the antenna and type of antennas so let's understand about antennas as well now here you can see that uh, we have different type of antenna and actually different type of requirement is there and that's why we have different type of antenna so sometimes we need focused beam sometimes we need uh, a smooth and surrounded or equi equal spaced uh, rf frequencies or beam sometimes we want uh, long range radio frequencies sometimes we need uh, short range radio frequencies that will be inside the room So that's the main reason uh, you can see here that we have different type of antennas because the requirements are also different different according to that we will go and check that what type of antennas are available and what is the frequency range they are available with before that let's try to understand a few of the basic things so first of all here you can see that uh, we have the isotropic antenna uh, where uh, we have say e example um, here in the diagram you can see that you have x y and z direction so at this point of time suppose if i have two section one section i have in x direction that is the horizontal and one section in is in say for example y direction x and y direction y direction is vertical and suppose the requirement is that that I need space type of radio frequency. So uh, what does it mean that uh, it simply means that you put the access point in the center and then from that access point uh, going forward in a circular manner, you have the radio frequencies. So whatever object that is coming in that circular uh, uh, radius in that particular premises, uh, they will get the radio frequency equally that's the whole uh, idea behind that about the isotropic uh, antennas but the problem here is that to make isotropic uh, antennas and that isotropic antenna will fit with all the requirement is actually not possible so that's the reason we have a different different types of antenna categories now here you can see in the diagram that you have horizontal direction that is azimuthal and then we have the elevation plane as well that is the e plane so we have two plane basically h plane and e plane and according to that if you do, go and do the cross section so if you go and do the section here in the diagram bottom let me try to highlight so here you can see that how the frequencies uh, in terms of db that is increasing uh, as we are going outside to the circle uh, so here you can see that the outermost circle usually represents the strongest signal strength and the inner circle represents weaker signal strength because they are in the minus so minus 30 is less than minus 5 minus 5 is obviously bigger than minus 10 and etc correct so outer circles uh, representing higher uh, signal and that's one of the important point that we should know so now we understand about the uh, isotropic antenna and that's actually uh, not uh, possible to build we have different type of antennas then we have the azimuthal and the e plane then uh, we know this point that okay while going forward your signal strength will increase as per this section as per e and h or h or e section then what is gain now gain is nothing 
but it's the um, focus so suppose if you have antenna and that antenna what is the focus what is the focal so that's the gain uh, so again what does it mean it simply mean you can think like this uh, we know at this point of time that uh, we have seen the antenna so if, suppose if you have parabolic antenna and then in center you have the central knob or you have the center in between in between means you are focused on something so your frequency where you are putting the focus on that's actually termed as a gain and we'll see that different antenna what gain what capability they have okay all right so here you can see in the diagram that different type of antenna either isotropic omnidirectional directional you can see um, the gain because the focus is changing and that's why the gain of the antenna is changing again the new term we have is the beam width so what is the beam width many manufacturer manufacturer list the beam width of antenna as a measure of antenna focus okay so again two term gain is a measure of how effectively uh, it can focus rf energy in a certain direction so that's the gain you focus in certain direction or your energy in certain direction and then the beam width beam width is nothing but the focus so your focus and energy in that particular focus so your focus is your beam width and energy rf signal in that particular focus is nothing but the gain all right so understanding these many terms now what we can do that now we can understand the types of antenna uh, we know that we have the polariz polarization so that electromagnetic wave is nothing but the polarization earlier we have discussed that we have the electromagnetic wave and the magnetic wave so we have um, electromagnetic wave magnetic wave they are in the 90 uh, 90 direction so in between the angle between these waves is 90 degree all right so knowing these many facts now what we can do we can go and learn about the antenna again if the electromagnetic wave is in the horizontal direction that is horizontal polarization if it is in the vertical direction that will be the vertical polarization okay and that is shown here in the diagram so if vertically if signal is going vertically you can see the signal received uh, this is vertical direction or, or it can be in horizontal direction great so now let's focus on antenna we have two types of antenna i will see that um, uh, subcategories inside these types so we have om omnidirectional and the directional now omnidirectional as name suggests that it will be equidistant correct so let me quickly show you one of the example for omnidirectional uh, that is the dipole antenna dipole antenna again you can see in the diagram that uh, from the center they are in the equal distance and their gain is uh, around again we know what is the gain so the gain is around plus 2 to 5 db okay again you can see the e and h the uh, horizontal is azimuthal and the e elevation plane and the cross section here in the diagram now again in uh, omnidirectional so here you can see that omnidirectional one example for that is a dipole and again uh, in omnidirection the other example is the monopole okay one of the cisco uh, cisco is a big vendor for the networking and one of the ap inside cisco they have six tiny antennas six tiny monopole antennas in their uh, access point uh, by the end of this section we have this summary of whatever we are going to discuss here so in the summary section we'll learn more about that now what is happening in the uh, say for example in monopole antenna so let me quickly show you the summary i have so here you can see the summary in omnidirectional we have dipole monopole and integrated uh, dipole we have discussed that the gain is a 2.2 up to 3.5 monopole you can see that 2.2 2.2 so we have uh, two uh, spectrum 2.4 and 5 gigahertz obviously in 5 gigahertz you will find much more signal strength 2.4 you have uh, less signal strength but there are uh, vendor made uh, access point maybe cisco or any other vendor who is making this uh, access point 
those access point they are supporting both uh, both the standard 2.4 and 5 gigahertz okay all right so then you have the monopole uh, after that we have the directional antenna why we have the directional antenna because in certain direction we need much more gain so here you can see that we have the cisco patch antenna and the gain for that cisco patch antenna is 6 to 8 db okay uh, this is supporting 2.4 gigahertz the gain is 6 to 8 uh, in 5 gigahertz they have 7 to 10 db support and here you can see the di uh, diagram uh, in this diagram clearly you can see that focus is in one direction right if you go and see the other direction you can see uh, they are equidistance mostly they are equidistance in case of omnidirectional again if i go back mostly they are equidistance but if you go and check the directional antenna you'll find that the focus is in one direction so for this antenna that is the patch antenna you can see the gain next uh, we have the yagi antenna again the name of the inventor is the yagi so that's why this is the yagi antenna in yagi again you can see this is very much focused on one direction and the gain for these antennas are uh, 10 to 14 for 2.4 and we can see the um, list as well cisco does not support or offer 5 gigahertz yagi cisco is not supporting 5 gigahertz yagi so that's why it is not there for 5 gigahertz but you can see that's 10 to 14 for yagi and if i go and check the list so you can see yeah. so 5 gigahertz cisco is not supporting so it is not listed there all right then finally we have the parabolic dish antennas again uh, the gain will increase because the focus uh, will increase in certain direction so in this case you can see the linear type of uh, azimuthal and the elevation plane the horizontal and the uh, e-plane uh, elevation plane now the focus it's quite linear but again you can see on other hand what gain we have uh, the gain is 30 to 20 to 30 db and that's the big now again in this summary slide you can see the directional antenna the parabolic uh, for 2.4 gig they have 20 to 30 and 5 gig also they have 20 to 30 uh, gain in this range okay so you can take this particular chart as a reference and we have discussed about first of all the term use inside the antenna like uh, what is beam width what is gain what is uh, polarization what is azimuthal what is e plane etc etc then we have gone through and check the types of antenna uh, in omnidirection we have dipole monopole integrated in directional we have patch yagi and parabolic antennas so what type of wireless network we have let's understand different type of wireless network and then we'll focus on wireless lan so here in the diagram you can see starting from a small uh, w pan and then wireless lan then w man and then w van as well you have the personal area network example is bluetooth um, the distance is from 20 to 30 feet or 7 to 10 meters then we have wireless lan that we are going to study in this particular course that range is 100 meter and we know that we have band 2.5 and 5 gigahertz band apart from that we have the uh, metropolitan uh, area network as well uh, ymax is one of the example for that obviously it is for wider range and then we have the wide area uh, wide area wireless network as well uh, that is again is for broader area example is the mobile services uh, mobile towers etc okay so let us focus on wireless local area network now we know that we have transmitter transmitter we have a receiver correct a transmitter they are going to send their electromagnetic wave receiver they have to be in the line to receive those uh, signals if in between there is any interference uh, any obstacle any problem any type of object then the signal will be degraded uh, the frequency will be degraded and the overall performance will be degraded correct now we may we may have one way communication we may have two-way communication and suppose if we have more number of 
devices in a group in a particular wireless area uh, LAN group then there is so much interference and the problem so just to mitigate from this particular problem that we have we need one central device that can work on behalf of all the devices correct and that central device name is access point now here in the diagram you can see that all the devices all the wireless devices or endpoint they are going to associate with access point now uh, there are so many different terms and we should understand at this point of time so in the diagram you can see that first of all you have one circle and that circle is nothing but the uh, so for example this point of time this is the uh, wireless area like in ospf you have area at this point of time just think that this is one of the area set this is one of the area for example area zero inside area zero you have different endpoints and you have the ap so this ap uh, the bssid is nothing but the mac address of the access point and obviously mac addresses are unique for the physical devices so the physical id that this device has is the uh, bss id uh, here you can see that you have the basic service set so complete area zero you can think that the standard inside complete area zero is basic service set so we have the basic service set we have the access point we have bss id now what is happening and what is important here is like routers what routers are doing they are advertising their network same way what access point will do he will advertise his network and his network identification is nothing but ssid so ssid he is advertising whoever endpoint will associate that particular ssid that will be become part of that group part of that set correct and that's actually the truth so here you can see that you have the uh, basic service set BSS inside BSS you have the BSS ID that's the AP ID and this AP is uh, advertising its network and all the endpoints they are going and connecting with that particular uh, network okay and that network is nothing but the service set identifier again the endpoints that's the member uh, they will they will go and associate with that particular network obviously they will do some sort of negotiation in between that and then they have to associate with that particular network now from ap if you want to uh, do some sort of access control that we can do so here in the diagram you can see that uh, certain group of devices can communicate or certain members can communicate to each other certain members will not uh, communicate with each other later on we'll discuss more about the packet type and communication etc all right so so far we understand that what is ap what is members what is ssid what is bssid what is bss now very important thing here is that for each and every wireless network you should have the core and that core is nothing but wired network so behind every wireless network we have the backbone wired network and that backbone wired network is termed as a distribution system ds so here you can see in the diagram that you have ds and again behind that you have router switches firewall etc etc so how the connection is we have bss that is connecting with ds that may be any l2 or l3 switch and suppose if we have multiple vlans so suppose one vlan representing one of the ssid other vlan representing uh, other ssid or maybe you have multiple uh, vlans across your ssid depends upon what design you have now in that case also uh, the bss and ds should have trunk link in between that so we know this concept from our uh, vlan concept that if you have multiple vlan so there should be trunk in between to allow those vlan frames okay so that's the concept of ds and the connection with bss now the next concept we have is the extended service set so what does it mean now if you see the diagram you'll understand uh, 
So for example, you have two BSS, BSS1, obviously a BSS means um, BSS having BSS ID. So that means they have their uh, unique MAC addresses. Uh, in very easy term that you have two different access point and these access point having same network. So their network is nothing but SSID, SSID. So SSID is same and they are connected with the DS distribution system or a switch. So now the BSS so collection of BSS you can think as an extended service set. So BSS or N into BSS is equal to ESS extended services. Now if I have one user here who is associating with one of the AP and then he is uh, going to the other AP and he is associating with other AP. So at that time that concept is termed as a roaming. So user is roaming uh, across the network, but we can say that uh, throughout you it may have different AP, correct? You can see that it has different AP, but they are part of same network. So that concept is nothing um, but the roaming. All right, so let's stop here. Uh, we have covered the basics of the wireless LAN so far. Next, we have 802.11 frame format. Although we know that how 802.3, that is the IEEE Mac based format how it is working and how it look like so here you can see that you have preamble the source destination address and then you have the data field plus fcs switch used to learn all these end host machines and then uh, depending that uh, do we have l3 communication or l2 communication for l3 communication again uh, if you are crossing the boundary then the router will come into the picture but that's the way that the lan and the broadcast network used to work in wireless networking the communication is very different why because we know that all these end system first of all they have to learn the ssid ssid is nothing but the advertised network from the access point so they have to learn and associate and authenticate this ssid after that they will start the communication because we have ssid into the picture because we have different type of uh, wireless client or different cl uh, different type of end systems they are part of wireless network and they they can uh, communicate to each other as well or they can communicate to the machine that is behind the wireless so wireless will connect with wire and then wire is connected with some other ho host machine so the bottom line is that that you may have various mode of communication and depending upon what type of communication you are doing that's why we have different type of addresses so here you can see that you have four different address address one two three four then you have a duration uh, id why it is because this technology based upon congestion avoidance See, the Ethernet LAN is something like collision detection, and this is actually a, a collision avoidance, not congestion, collision avoidance. Now, in case of collision avoidance, what is happening? That you wait, uh, you have some timer, you have some back off algorithm, and you will see. So, if it is clear to send, I will send. If the media path is not clear, I will wait till that particular point of time. So that's why it's the collision uh, avoidance mechanism. Now here you can see that you may have uh, end system. Uh, those are the wireless client where you are doing the communication or you are doing the communication with the machine that is behind the uh, behind this AP that is in the wired. So wired versus wireless. And that's why we have this DS bit set. So either zero or one. So if you have if you have two bit, then you can have four condition. Say a zero one, a zero zero, zero one, one zero, and one one. Now this zero zero means that two hosts are doing the communication. They are purely part of wireless network. Now this one zero you can see that you are doing the communication from wireless to wired network then you have this zero one that means 
uh, the bits are coming uh, the frame is coming from host from the wired network to the wireless and finally if you have access point a and access point b and if they have some communication that will be one one okay so let's try to understand what about these so many addresses types yes we have four different type of address type here you can see that first of all they must have ta transmitter address and receiver address now this address one field always contains ra that is receive address though its extract contents may vary depend on where the frame is headed like was address 2 is always contains ta so two address is fixed address 1 is receive address 2 is transmit correct apart from that obviously when you are sending the frame then you should have the actual source address you should have the actual destination address etc so let me try to explain this in a diagram here in the diagram you can see and we are going to understand all the address types uh, address 1 2 3 and 4 remember in this diagram I don't have AP to AP communication so that's why address 4 is blank okay now we have one case that host 1 wants to communicate to host 2 so what will be the source and what will be the destination so here you can see the source is source address is uh, the transmission address is uh, this and the destination address is this so actual source actual destination now who is the receiver at this point of time the access point is the receiver so that's why his mac address okay so clearly you can see uh, first of all the addresses and second the bits so since you are sending uh, one to zero means wireless to wired so that's why you can see here that this is going to hit okay and uh, here you can see the address one is bssid address two is uh, the ta and then the address three is the destination okay now then the host 2 will respond when host, host 2 will respond then source and destination address will get changed so now who is the source he is the source who is the destination this guy is destination with respect to host 2 now what about the mac address of the bssid or the ap that will be the transmit address so he has received the address and then he is transmitting you can think the logic like this that is the transmit address wrist uh, the receive address and the uh, source address they are going to be changed now which is the use case this one so here you can see address one is ra who is going to receive address two is bssid who is going to transmit and the address three is the source address correct and who is the source so this guy is the source although this is a bit of uh, tricky so you can pause the recording you can take snapshot and you can do your mapping but this is the way that the uh, frame format look like and the fields inside the frame format uh, representing these addresses and these ds bits let us understand the 802.11 frame types as we know that we have three different type of plane normally in sd van also or in routers also so we have the control plane we have as you can think that for frames also we have management frame control frame and data frame now what is the use of management frame and why it is important so let's try to understand all these uh, options that we have First of all, starting with management frame. Now, this management frame is there to advertise the BSS and its capability to the clients. Now, what are those? So, first of all, you can see that you have beacon, and beacon is something that will be sent via the AP. Uh, at this point of time, you can think that okay, beacon 
I'm, uh, AP is sending the beacon to all of the clients and if client will go and open and check their wireless network they can receive those beacons now it's up to client that they want to join or not correct so if i go to my laptop and if i go and check my wireless connectivity i can see a range of ssid or b ssid generally those are ssid not b ssid but i can see all those ssid ssids are nothing but the uh, network advertised by the ap or the wireless network so that's nothing but the beacon that's the one of the management frame then probe what is probe probe is something suppose you want to join to the ap and then you are sending the request to the ap that a ap i want to join that will be the probe and that's why this is the passive so beacon is a passive scanning and probe is active scanning okay next we have the authentication and deauthentication now in wireless networking we have this authentication option that the clients can authenticate with the ap and even they they can do the deauthentication as well so the first stage you can see on your laptop that oh you can see n number of ssid or so many ssid now next thing if you go and click there it will ask you some password what is the password if you put that correct password it will get authenticated if you do not put it will not get authenticated correct so those things are those frames are actually the management frame then we have important terms association deassociation reassociation so suppose once you are able to discover the network then you are able to do the authentication then you are going to do the association with the ap now in this association phase the access point they are sending a unique association identifier aid to the clients who are going to do the association suppose if you want to leave you can do the deassociation if you want to change one ap to other ap you can do the reassociation so different terms are there related to association now we have the action frame as well uh, suppose uh, you want to roam or you want to extend uh, the wireless capabilities so at that time this uh, action frame will come into the picture so here you can see that you have this management frame then we have the control frames although there are nine control frames but these four are important so control frame are again it's not the payload it's not the data it's the control mechanism uh, so for every uh, frame we are getting the acknowledgments and that will provide you so for example reliability in the channel we are getting the acknowledgement for block of data as well okay then uh, we have this power uh, poll power save poll so what does it mean that a frame sent from client to ap to request the next frame that was buffered while client's radio was power on is something like a power saving mode um, then finally uh, and the important one we have the rts and cts uh, rts and cts is something like a timer so it's something like request uh, to send or clear to send these are the terms and why these terms are become important because uh, request to send and clear to send rts cts uh, they are not only providing the uh, timer to send uh, the frames but they are used for callies and avoidance as well okay so uh, the rts cts are a mechanism to do some sort of uh, callies and avoidance in the channel as well so finally once you have your management done once you your control done the next thing is to send or receive the data uh, for that reason the data frame will come into the picture at this point of time we know uh, from our previous lessons that we have four different type of address field so the source address the destination address the ap address and then you have the destination behind the uh, wireless that is in the wired network so you have these four addresses and then uh, the actual communication of data can be happen hi there thanks for your enrollment we are in one minute ad break in this break i'm going to
show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount every month, three times, first week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses, you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always ping me over YouTube. You can send me email. You can ask for those coupons. I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new, like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go, continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses, and study well. All the best. Let's understand the client scans for AP and a roaming feature. We have already discussed about beacon and probe. We know uh, what does it mean by passive scan. So passive scan means the access point here you can see that they are sending their beacon to the host with some time duration that they are offering their network to the host. Now it's up to host that he can go select that network and then do the authentication and association. That's the passive scan. Now, uh, this passive scan is good, but uh, still uh, the drawback there is that the host, they have to wait for certain time duration to get the network or to get the advertised network from the access point. Next, we have the active scan in that the client itself is sending the probe. Uh, and he's asking that, say, who has this network? And then the access point, they are responding. Okay, I am there. Uh, you want to authenticate, you want to associate. If you associate, you'll get the unique association ID, AID. Now, how the uh, host will go and join a particular AP. So here you can see that we have several steps. Step number one to five. That's uh, first of all, the host will do the authentication request. Then he will get the response. Then he will do the association request. He will get the association response and unique AID, association identifier. And then finally, he will go and join that. Okay, and all these steps are listed here. So for example, uh, point number five is the response also contains the AID that uniquely identify host one as an associated client in effect to AID is host membership, etc. So these are the steps, authentication, obviously request response, association request response, and then finally they will get the unique AID. Now, if a host or client want to leave it, so he can do the deassociation. I remember here that deauthentication and deassociation are different thing. So, if you are deassociating, doesn't mean that you are deauthenticating, or you have to authenticate again next time. You can be deassociated, but you are still authenticated. Correct. Now, next very important topic is roaming. So far, we have studied that suppose if you are moving from one uh, BSS or one area cell to other area cell, that means you are roaming. And suppose different AP having same SSID, so you can roam from one place to other place. As per the signal uh, capability, you, you will go and get the uh, you will go and associate the access point. That's the technical term association. Now here you can see all the listed listed steps. What is happening in the roaming? First of all, say your signal strength is getting weak. Your signal to noise ratio is getting weak. It's time to roam. So you're not getting proper signal. Here you can see the client is there on the edge and he's away from the AP, but he's near to the other AP. Or if you roam, he can get near to the AP. And you want to go and associate with a new uh, high bandwidth or he want to get some uh, high frequency signals. 
so that's why he want to roam and uh, go to the other uh, ssid now in this case what is happening that the client will send the probe now he will get the probe response then here you can see that uh, the association request will initiate okay uh, association request will get initiate and i want to highlight this point number five here and it's important here now in this case when <clears throat> two device in this case when client is doing the uh, roaming across the uh, across the ap or across the uh, wireless network so at that time point number five is important so whatever buffer whatever information that ap1 has he will go and pass the information to ap2 and then he will use the ds distribution system he will go and use the uh, wired media to bypass or to relay the buffer information and then finally uh, this client number one will get associated with ap2 okay so you can see all these steps uh, if you have single access point we know what are the steps you will do the authentication means you will do authentication request response association request response and you will be the part of the network or ssid in case of roaming when you are getting some issues you roamed then you do the probing and then again you will do the uh, association uh, then this ap they will sync their uh, buffer data and finally you will be the part of the new access point network correct all right let's try to understand this wireless architecture inside wireless architecture you'll find that we have several type of architecture and what is suitable for enterprise level we can discuss uh, we have some popular one like cloud-based architecture or a split mac so let's understand all different type of architecture so first of all here you can see in the diagram that we have autonomous architecture autonomous architecture means that you have access point that is working independently okay so here in the diagram you can see that you have access point connected with the distribution system or connected with the switch uh, the problem with this design is that although you can manage the ssid but suppose for all these access point uh, you have to manage the their own management ip so there is no central authority from where you can manage the common uh, work or you can manage the common security framework you can manage the management ips etc so if the network will grow in this case in this fashion you'll find that it's uh, difficult to manage and it's not a good design for a big enterprise network or even uh, when your ap's number of ap will grow more than say for example 30 to 75 or 100 or 200 etc it is okay although for very small type of infrastructure where you have less number of endpoints where you don't want any third party or any controller type of device that can manage all these access point so for that reason it's it's okay so this is the first uh, that is the autonomous architecture and then next to reduce the complexity we have cloud based architecture one of the uh, popular cloud based architecture we have is cisco meraki where you have the cloud hosted controller and then uh, you have your meraki based access point situated in the branches in the lan area network etc so here you can see that you you are responsible means the ap's are responsible for the data plane traffic but they are getting all the control information from the dashboard that is hosted in the cloud or we have the cloud hosted control plane although the good thing about this that manageability is easy we can easily manage uh, our infrastructure even uh, from one single place we can go and log in and check uh, various reports various configuration etc from one central place that's the key we have uh, with the cloud hosted uh, control plan again uh, when we are talking about cloud based uh, controller we have the control plan hosted in the, uh, the cloud and with the control plan uh, we can do various operation like we have we can uh, configure manage monitor uh, create the reports 
even we have some visual representation uh, we can do the troubleshooting as well so we have long list that we can do uh, from the control plane and again the data plane is there that is responsible to pass the data okay so now you can see that we have autonomous architecture that evolved to cloud-based architecture and finally uh, that is our interest for this particular course is the split Mac architecture where uh, we have the wireless LAN controller WLC okay so now here in the diagram you can see that you have two access point one is the autonomous uh, that is that evolved from autonomous uh, architecture and then we have lightweight access point where they have given their brain to the central location that is the WLC so from WLC, what are the things we can do? We can go and we can do the RF management. We have the association and roaming management, client authentication, security management, QS, etc. There are so many things that you can go and check from the WLC and you can manage n number of uh, access point or the data plane devices. Again, it depends that which version of WLC controller or LAN controller we are using. According to that capability, we can manage the number of lightweight access point. Now what data plan device is doing that they are doing the RF uh, transmit to receive Mac management encryption, etc. So now I have one comparison chart here. You can see that uh, autonomous WLAN and lightweight autonomous just name suggests that they are autonomous access point configure uh, configuration of each access point independent operation managed via Cisco works W L S E W D S access point redundancy. These are the independent things then managed from the WLC. So they are the lightweight access point configured via Cisco LAN controllers dependent on Cisco LAN controller management via Cisco WLC Cisco wireless LAN controller redundancy. So in, in this case in this architecture we may have primary secondary tertiary WLC as per the uh, failure scenario. All right. So here you can see that in this case uh, the APs we are telling them as a uh, lightweight access point and they have to go and register with the central authority that is the WLC now is still the question arise that how how the lightweight access point will go and registered with WLC what about the traffic how the traffic will move uh, from one client to other client in case both are registered with WLC so all those things and the uh, protocol between the LAP and the WLC uh, we will go and discuss in the next recording we have discussed that the access point and the controller they have to communicate so how they are going to control uh, communicate is so they are going to build the cap wap tunnel now you can see the full form of cap wap is control and provisioning of wireless access points and there are so many RFCs that you can go and refer. So here you can see that cap app is defined in these RFC 5415, and 18, where you can go and learn more about this cap web tunnel. So let's read this as a cap web as a short, but you can see the full form as well. Now, when the lightweight access point and the WLC they are forming the a tunnel in between at that time we have two different type of tunnel we have tunnel for control messages or control plane and then we have the tunnel for data plane as well now if you correlate this with the st van and we are thinking now that now we are using stn and st van and st lan solution but this wlc is quite a bit old technology which is using the concept of stn even for example cisco prime then wlc and other uh, mechanism also was there to manage the infrastructure in terms of that we have some central authority who is managing the infrastructure like stn or st van etc if we go and learn more about the cap uh, information we'll find that yeah truly the tunnel that is building between the uh, wlc and rest of the ap's they have exactly same type of certification process that we have 
say in case of uh, vsmart that's the control plane and v edge that is the data plane device so here you can see that CapMap they are using UDP port number 5246. They are using secure authenticated DTLS channel because we know, uh, say in case of SD-WAN, we have both the option. Either we can use TCP or we can use UDP. Uh, most of the other SD-WAN technology, they are using UDP-based IPsec tunnels or UDP-based channels. Uh, in our WLC, we are using UDP-based control tunnel and data tunnel. Now for data tunnel, the DTLS is optional, means the secure tunnel is optional, means this, at least the encryption uh, is optional. Uh, we, if we want, we can use, if we want, we uh, do not use. So here you can see that, but are not encrypted by default. So tunnel in between them, so tunnel is there, but the encryption is optional if you want you can use it now here you can see that we have two tunnel we have the data tunnel we have the control tunnel and uh, in this manner the access points they will go and communicate the wlc that that's the one part now what will happen in this case in this case uh, behind the scene what is happening so these tunnels that you are seeing uh, in between the wlc and the access point they are using ip address so that means they are ip based tunnels since they are ip based tunnels so what they can do and there are two things first thing that uh, the vlan so whatever vlan i have in the uh, distribution system obviously this wlc is connected with switch so those vlans information will get passed under the tunnel to the uh, ap's access point and these ssid information again will go and pass to the distribution system to the switches okay so in that way the communication will happen so you don't need trunk link here so that's why you can see that i have the access link so i don't need trunk link and then i have to do encapsulation dot one q etc etc but that's the enhancement because you are creating the tunnel so obviously it will uh, send and receive the packet depending upon the tunnel source and destination in in this case the tunnel source and destination is the ip addresses of ap and the wlc so suppose if you have more number of tunnels uh, uh, in other words you can think that if you have more number of access point then you have more number of uh, number of cap map tunnels and then the communication will happen like this so th this is the communication channel that we have okay so now once you have the wlc so what are the role what are the activity that WLC can do? So WLC can go and do the dynamic channel as, uh, assignment, uh, transmit power optimization, self-healing wireless coverage, flexible client roaming, dynamic client load balancing, RF monitoring, security parameters, QS parameters, etc., etc. So what not means we can do n number of things from WLC because that is the brain I have. That is the central mechanism to manage all the lightweight access points, correct? Even you can see that we can do the wireless intuition protection uh, system as well. So this is the usability and use case of the uh, cap app tunnel that we have. And this is the mechanism by which the WLC is talking to the access points. Let us continue our discussion and learn about the centralized wireless network architecture and flex connect architecture. Now we know at this point of time that uh, that the WLC and the AP, they are going to have the cap map tunnel in between them and then the communication will happen. Now before moving further, you can go and check the uh, comparative chart from different type of WLCs that we have uh, in Cisco. Uh, so for example, I have taken snapshot from one of the link from Cisco. Here uh, we can clearly see that we have different type of WLC for different type of purpose. Although we have virtual controller as well, we have controller for ISR G2 starting from 2500, 36505500, going to 8500 and nine. now we have the 9800 WLCs as well. 
if we have more number of users if we want to manage more number of uh, uh, lightweight access point then obviously the we have to move and we have to go to the higher end of WLCs so it's just the evolution of WLC how much uh, clients we have how much APs we have what security feature flex connect QS etc depending upon that we can go and choose one of the WLC for our organization now once we are done with that uh, then we can go and apply the WLC and we can connect the APs with WLC that's the overall idea and then we and then the traffic will start uh, flowing now we have this centralized solution that all these devices will go and connect or create the tunnel with WLC very much at this point of time we can think that this is hub and a spoke type of topology where you have your hub uh, as WLC and then you have the spoke so spokes they are making the tunnel with the hub now there is one problem with this particular architecture uh, we'll discuss about that problem and the solution as well uh, before coming to the problem you can see that since you have your central authority to manage each and everything related to access point so that's why the user identity means again the WLC is connected with the eyes and they are talking with each other related to users and profile and roaming uh, profiles as well now user identity or a user services or a user so what are the user and its roaming capability that can be managed from one place because everything is managed from one place so that's the power we have we have the centralized authority to manage each and everything uh, next in this diagram you can see although the physical uh, architecture although the physical uh, although the movement of data in the physical path is different so here you can see that the uh, the actual movement of the data will be from switch one to two and three uh, in short that in between you may have a number of switches on top of that you have created the cap app tunnel so again you can see that uh, from access point to the distribution system or the core layer switch uh, i have the cap web tunnel and then the traffic can go but the physical movement or the data traffic movement via the link uh, will be different so that's one interesting thing we have although we are not concerned about uh, what are the configuration what are the trunk vlan passing to the intermediate devices correct because those are we can think that is transient devices on top of that i have my tunnel so you can see that you have the benefit now what is the disadvantage what disadvantage we have now if you see this diagram you'll find that although uh, i am local to this access point highlighted so let me quickly highlight that so i am local to this particular access point and i should not go to my hub and then i should come back or i should not go to my central location and come back although i can do this local movement of the traffic a movement of a traffic locally right so that's the problem we have that uh, if you do not give the local intelligency so all the time the traffic will go um, uh, they will go and traverse this cap web tunnel uh, they will go to the central authority and then they will return back now, what's the solution the solution is the flex connect wireless architecture now what will happen in flex connect that uh, we can understand from the diagram as well so we have two type of architecture first is the split mac a uh, split mac means you have your central authority wlc uh, you can go to wlc and come back uh, again you can see that you have cap web tunnel and um, again the same thing you can see in the other diagram as well so you can go to the wlc and then suppose if you have local printer to the switch system you are going there although if you go and use the flex connect feature flex connect feature what it will do uh, that it will give the device as a local intelligency so what does it mean it simply mean that for local transmission you will not go and use the cap web tunnel although you can go and directly use a printer because to reach to this path it's easy 
okay so here you can see in the diagram that the traffic path uh, during flex connect local switching you are doing things locally that's the power we have with the flex, uh, flex connect we have a small tip here that flex connect was previously known as hybrid remote edge access point H rip feature to maintain connectivity between WLC and branch side lap the van link should have a round trip latency less than 300 millisecond for a normal data and less than 100 for the real time traffic okay so the concept the idea behind is that when we are doing the flex connect architecture so at that time we can do the local switching hi there thanks for your enrollment we are in one minute ad break in this break i am going to show you that i have so many courses uploaded over udemy and if you are going to enroll my courses you will get 95 percent discount every month three times first week mid of the month and the last week of the month i am sharing the coupons if you go and use those coupons then my courses related to ccnp related to cci all those courses you are going to get heavy discount up to 95 percent you can see the prices are a uh, little bit higher here but if you go and apply the coupon the prices will go rock bottom so go use those coupons suppose if you don't have those coupons then you can always uh, ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses and study well. All the best. Next, we have to learn about how we can do the implement the controller. Before that, we should understand that what type of interfaces and port available inside the WLC and what will be the connectivity from the WLC to the switches. Uh, we have four different type of port. We have service port, distribution system port, console port, redundancy port. Now the service port will be used for out of band management, uh, system recovery, initial boot. This will always connect as an access port. So we are going to use this as a OOB out of band management. Then we have the uh, most important port that is the distribution system port. We know this thing that distribution system port means that the WLC you are connecting with the switch. Now we have the capability or we have the feature that we can do the aggregation we can use leak aggregation uh, protocol and we can group those interfaces and connect with the switch now these ports are always 802.21 q because again uh, we are going to pass multiple vlans information uh, via the wlc then we have the console port where we can connect the console port for recovery initial boot etc and finally uh, in case we need multiple wlc for redundancy for that we have the redundancy port now here in the diagram you can see that we have the distribution system obviously uh, the wlc is connected with the uh, switch and that's why you have the distribution port we can have the link aggregation group uh, service port is for auto band management. You have the console port and if you want to have multiple WLC so we can use the redundant port as well. Then from WLC to AP we have the cap web tunnel and then the information will go and get exchange. Now these are the port or these are one type of port we have. Again, uh, we'll discuss more about other port uh, analogy as well. At this point of time, we know that the AP and the WLC, they will go and form the cap web tunnel and the distribution port, they have the, uh, we should enable the 802.1Q and we should do the link aggregation uh, protocol or link aggregation as well in between the WLC and the distribution switch. All right, so as for the model, you can see that which model have 
uh, the distribution port and service port listed here in the table again if we want if we have more number of APs, then we should go and check the higher end of the controller and the capability increase the throughput will increase the overall performance will increase but again uh, the cost will also get increased. Now what is happening? So these are the ports we have we have service port distribution system console and the redundancy port but internally the controller must uh, somehow map these uh, ports to the equivalent logical port. So inside the controller we have the equivalent logical port. So for example, we have the management interface. Now what is use of management interface obviously for the management related traffic like radius authentication WLC to WLC communication web based SSH session SNMP NTP syslog etc. Okay now in this diagram, you'll uh, find the clear picture about what we are talking. So here you can see that first we have the management interface, then we have the AP manager interface as well. We have the service port we have discussed just now that service port will do OOB and various tasks related to service port. We have the dynamic interfaces as well. So what is happening here that these VLANs that is coming from the switch side, they are going to map with the AP. And then again, this AP somehow has to associate with the access points as well. This AP is the WLC. So let me again uh, redo this switch will go and connect with the WLC and WLC has a connectivity with the AP in between WLC and AP. We have the cap app channel. All right. So what is the use of AP manager interface? They are the dynamic interface used to terminate the cap web channel between the controller and AP. So here you're seeing this AP manager actually the use of this to terminate the cap map channel in between the AP and WLC. Then we have the virtual interfaces again virtual interfaces are uh, just they have just the use case. So what use case this virtual interfaces have is that IP address facing wireless client when the controller is uh, relaying client DHCP request performing a client uh, web authentication and supporting client mobility. It is used in client mobility. It is used uh, in a way that the WLC can relay the DHCP information uh, to the IP address facing wireless client. Okay, uh, and again, uh, this interface will be less of use, but yeah, we have the interface. Then we have service port interface. Uh, we have a study about this that this is used for the out of band management. Then finally, you can see that you have the dynamic interfaces as well. These dynamic interfaces are and uh, they have to connect VLAN to WLAN. That's the usability. Correct. So we have discussed about management interface. They are there for management traffic, different type of uh, management traffic like HTTPS, SSH, SNMP, NTP, etc. And then uh, you can see that management interface is actually important. So that's the one of the use. And then suppose the other use of this management interface is in case of AP manager interface is not available. So that performance or that task will be performed by the manager interface instead of okay. So that's the other use we have with the management interface. All right, so these are the interfaces here. You can see that these are the ports and here you can see that these are the interfaces we have in the WLC. So now let's stop here and let's go and do the initial setup. Next we have to perform the lab and in this we are going to do the initial setup for WLC. Uh, I am using the virtual WLC here and once you uh, are in the first page then you can uh, give the username and the password and then you click start once you go and click start the next page that you will get this will be like this so let's do and complete this I'll go and give the name say for example virtual WLC one and the country I can go and select anyone so let me go and select say for example any of the nearby countries say for example just an example and testing 
so I can go and say select London then the time I can see the time zone and then I can go and give the NTP server then we can go and give the management IP so that's the management IP in my case then the subnet mask for the management IP then the default gateway I have in my case so that is say 19.1.1 or 11.1 yep then the management VLAN ID uh, at that at this point of time we can leave this as default all right so now we can go and click next so I will go here and click next next you can see that we have to create the uh, wireless network and then we have some of the advanced setting let me give the correct default gateway and click next so what is the network name I have so I can go and give cloud demo then what key I will leave this as default but we have WPA personal and enterprise then the passphrase I'll go and give the passphrase let me confirm that then what is the management VLAN we'll leave this as management VLAN if I have any DHCP server I can go and give uh, and then we are very much done with this step so now you can see that how easy is to do the setup now I will go next and will verify the advanced setting as well so we'll go next Here you can see the virtual IP address the local mobility group the service port interface and these things we have discussed now the virtual IP address uh, it should be say some of the private address because those private address will be used uh, locally suppose if I use any of the address which is not private and that may be conflict um, there, there may be chances to uh, for the confliction all right so here you can see that we are giving the uh, virtual IP address and then uh, the service port we are leaving this as default now let me scroll up if we have some other parameters so here you can see you can go and uh, this is disable RF parameter optimization you can go and enable it and then you can see that client density low typical high traffic type is data I can go and use at, at this point of time the traffic type is data only all right so here you can see that please confirm the setting and apply so this is the setting that we have given the management IP the management gateway the network name security passphrase etc so once we are okay with this particular summary we can go and click next and then we can go and apply as well so this is the final page yes okay I want to apply this and then we can wait so once the setting apply then we can go and log in with the management IP so I logged in here with the management IP and then you will get this but uh, first page so now you can go and log in here you can see the management IP uh, 11.10 and then I can go and give the username and the password so let me go and give username and password then we'll get the first page so this is the first page that we have and here you will see the monitoring rogues interface wireless dashboard etc etc uh, interestingly in this first page you'll find that we have the best practices as well so suppose if you want to check the best practices you can go and verify that in this page in this first page because uh, we don't have any AP association we don't have any live traffic so everything is showing blank but if you go and click to advanced you will get 
this page that we are very much familiar of generally we are using this advanced tab to check each and everything related to the wlc so in advanced page you can see that you have the management ip then you have the service port 00 software version you can see uh, 8.7 uh, the name the uptime rest of the thing then the access point summary you can see nothing is there so that's why everything all the counters are zero but on the top you can see that you have monitor wlan so suppose if you want to create wlan so you have to get you have to go to this section and then you have to create the wireless uh, wlan Again, once you go and create there, then you will get multiple options uh, related to the WLAN. Uh, we can go and check this later on. Then the information about the WLC. So here you can see the long list of information that we have. And you can go and click and check each and uh, individual uh, tabs that you have you have management interface you have service port you have virtual port we have discussed about this correct and then we can go to the wireless at the moment everything is blank we can go and check the security again you can see the long list of security we have management then if you want to run any command we have some of the command support that we have so the page will look like this okay so this is the initial setup for the wlc and we should go and check the best practices that we have so if you go and check the best practices then we can see that uh, what are the cisco recommendations so let me quickly show you that you can go and click on top home here once you go and click to the home you'll uh, go back to the first page that we have opened and then you can, here you can see the best practices so uh, best practices related to infrastructure security rf management uh, apple devices ice radius okay and you can go and you can scroll and you can check all these best practice, uh, practices that we have okay so this was the initial baseline setting that we have with the wlc hi there thanks for your enrollment we are in one minute ad break in this break i'm going to show you that i have so many courses uploaded over udemy and if you're going to enroll my courses you will get 95 percent discount Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses, you are going to get heavy discount, up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom so go use those coupons suppose if you don't have those coupons then you can always uh, ping me over youtube you can send me email you can ask for those coupons i will provide you that coupon so get the coupon get the discount some of my courses over udemy they are best seller some of the courses are quite new like stvan automation dna automation uh, cci data center 3.0 those are the new uploads as well. So please go, continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses, and study well. All the best. Let us understand that the discovery of the controllers. Uh, we have the document, and we'll understand with that document that what are the steps that AP is going to discover the controller and then how the AP will go and select a certain WLC, that's the controller. So what is happening that we are going to boot the AP. So the first step is that you will go and boot the AP. So AP boot will happen and obviously it will go and contact the DHCP server to get the IP. And uh, suppose uh, there are options that we can have the static IP assignment as well, but we have the option for DHCP server as well. Once it get the IP, then it will try to discover the WLC. 
now for wlc discovery again uh, we will see this i have separate slides for that in detail that how wlc discovery happens but uh, the next step is that that the uh, ap will try to build the cap map tunnel with the wlc and inside that cap map tunnel obviously we have cap map control tunnel where we have the ap wlc control messages now the next step is that the AP will go and send the cap web join request. Now for that request, obviously the WLC will reply uh, for cap web as a cap web join response. So once we have the cap web tunnel built between AP and controller, AP know who is the controller, controller know who is the AP. Then uh, it's the role of WLC that he will go and check the image version. So there should not be mismatch in the WLC image and the AP image. So in that case, the AP will go and download the image and then again it has to re reboot. Suppose if the image is OK, then uh, from WLC, the config will get pushed related to RF, service set identifiers, security, QS, etc. And finally, the device will go into the run state. Now here you can see all the steps that are listed from 1 to 7. Now in some occasions due to some issue that WLC wants to reset the AP. So in, the, in that case again the AP will go and reset and uh, step number 1 will start. Okay, uh, one thing, one point to note here that while the APs they are downloading the image, uh, it may take some time to download and upgrade the image because downloading the, downloading the image and then booting uh, will take some time. All right, so what's the process for discovering the WLC? There are process that AP may have knowledge of WLC or with help of DHCP and DNS, they are getting that information or uh, the WLC is in some other network and then I have router in between, in between who's relaying the information. Uh, with help of broadcast, that's the broadcast on the local subnet. So for example, a broadcast on local subnet, what will happen? So suppose if your AP and WLC, they are in different subnet, then you have to go to the router in between and you have to relay that information like IP forward protocol UDP 5246. Uh, this is the UDP port for cap web control tunnel. Then you have the interface VLAN and you can go and give the IP uh, helper address for different type of WLCs. Okay, so that's the one uh, option or uh, one way. The other thing that uh, inside your AP you may have the information of the WLC and uh, as per the primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, the AP will go and check WLC1, then WLC2, then WLC3, and then they will go and contact or discover the WLC. Uh, we have option with DHCP. So once they are getting the IP address at that time, DHCP option 43 will be there to suggest the list of WLC addresses. It can use DNS as well to resolve capwap controller.local domain uh, with the DNS request. Again, if nothing will happen, again the AP will go reset and it will start the discovery process. At this point of time, when we have the discovering of a WLC that is working well, so at that time we have selecting a WLC option also. So what does it mean? It means that AP will go and try for primary, secondary, tertiary, means as per the priority of WLC, they will go and join. The second thing is that suppose if they don't have any primary, if they are not able to discover any primary, secondary, tertiary, then they will go and check in the local subnet. So who is the master controller? According to, the, according to that, they will go and choose one of the controller. And finally, they can go and check the least loaded controller as well. So as per the controllers and their connectivity means the controller, how many APs are associated, they can go and select one of the WLC. All right, so these are the methods for uh, discovering and joining process for AP and WLC. Hi there, thanks for your enrollment. We are in one minute ad break. In this break, I'm going to 
show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount every month, three times, first week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses, you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses and study well. All the best. We have layer two and layer three roaming. So let's understand that. Uh, we have already discussed this earlier that when we are doing the roaming, say in case of autonomous AP, uh, the client here you can see in the diagram can go and connect with client two as per their signal strength. When the signal strength will go uh, decreasing, then he can go and join the other available high strength uh, SSID or the AP. That's the normal way that the roaming is happening. And the other important thing here is that, that uh, in between that distribution system, that's the switch, uh, he has the state information of this particular client and then he can go and join. Now this is very uh, normal, easy standard process that the roaming will happen. Now the problem here is that we are not using this type of architecture in the enterprise network because enterprise network, we have N number of clients, we have N number of AP, we have good amount of WLCs, other controllers. So. Uh, the methodology that we are using in the enterprise network is purely a split MAC architecture. In case of a split MAC architecture, what will happen? So let's try to understand that. We know that in a split MAC architecture, the APs, they are going to form the cap map tunnel with the WLC. And in that case, if a client want to roam, there are two options. First, that that roaming can be layer two the roaming can be layer three. So what will be the difference between that? And there may be chances that I don't have only one WLC. We may have multiple WLCs connected with wired network. So let's try to understand layer two roaming. Uh, what is the key feature of, uh, about layer two roaming is that in that case, we are in the same subnet. We, we have the same big IP subnet inside that I want to roam. So here you can see in the diagram that uh, I have a user in 100.0 subnet and he wants to uh, roam from one AP to other AP. Uh, obviously you can see that uh, these APs, they have cap web tunnel with their uh, WLC. Suppose I have two WLC and their connected network is wired switch network, okay? So this is the use case. Now what will happen that when you roam, obviously from one place you have to de-associate, de other place you have to associate. So you will go and associate. Now this roaming is quite good, scalable. Why? Because most of the things we are not changing here. So we are not changing. Uh, and again, it depends upon the use case. So if up, this is up to us that if we don't want to change the IP address of this client, so in the new, uh, when he is going to join the new AP at that time also in the same IP and even the state information will be the, will be sync across WLC1 and WLC2. So in that case, we will get the seamless roaming type of uh, capability or the experience will be good because usually it will be less than 20 millisecond of the roam. 
Now the second option we have is the layer three roaming. Layer three roaming simply means that you are in two different domains. So suppose your exact IP is 100.0 and then you want to roam to 200.0. So you're crossing the subnet and then you want to roam. Again, the structure will be looking like the same, but the cap map tunnel you can see for AP1 and WLC1 and AP2 and WLC2, both are in different IP subnet. So what will happen now if this client want to move and he want to uh, de-associate and associate with other AP, he can do it. But still, because the IP segment will change, uh, here you have 100.0, here you have 200.0. Uh, so these WLCs, they are behind the scene forming the cap web tunnel over the switching system. So here you can see in the diagram that 100 is going to change into 200 and then finally they have the cap web tunnel in between that just to exchange the state information uh, of a client associated with AP1 with AP2. Correct, and you will find that naming of these uh, WLCs are also different. So, the initial client, when when client is uh, attached with one of the AP, and he wants to roam at that point of time, that WLC is anchor, and where he is going, and he is going to join the new uh, AP associated with WLC, that will be the foreign controller. So from anchor, I am going to connect with the foreign controller and then the roaming is happening as a L3 roaming. So here you can see with the help of diagram, it's easy to understand that how I'm connected with one AP and then I'm roaming. But again, the state change is happening with the help of cap app tunnel in case of L3 roaming. What are the steps we should do while doing the troubleshooting for WLAN? From where should we go and start the troubleshooting? Because we know that in troubleshooting, we have either top to bottom or bottom to top approach. So both the things we can do. Now, when we are talking about, uh, so for example, top to bottom, uh, so obviously you are at the label of WLC, that's the top, and then you can go and check the cap web tunnel. You can go and check the access point, uh, maybe access point related issue, maybe some physical issue, maybe memory, CPU, etc. Then you can go and check any authentication in between the, uh, the endpoint and the access point. So you can go from top to bottom, you can go and check, or you can go from bottom to top and you can go and check. So what are the touch points? So whenever we are talking about the uh, issue, we should go and check the touch points. So what are the things can be there? So here you can see at this in the diagram, you can see that you can go and check the channel feasibility. You can go and check the access point uh, feasibility. You can go and check the IP reachability in between the uh, access point and the WLC and then the cap web tunnel related uh, configurations or cap web related issues that we can go and check. Then we can go and check the authentication, uh, the ICE integration, uh, how it is integrated with the WLC. Again, we can go and check in case of dynamic address assignment that the DHCP and the DNS servers are working properly or not. Okay, so let's uh, discuss more about the approach that we have to use or we should use while doing the troubleshooting. So for any troubleshooting, we should define the problem. So we should know what's the problem first. Then uh, to reach out to the solution, we should have the multiple ways. Say for example, if certain destination, say for example, if ISP is down, or say for example, uh, a certain destination is down, a certain website is down, then what are the things you will do? Obviously, we'll do the ping and trace route and you can check the ping drop. You can go and check the trace route at which particular hop it is dropping. Now with ping, uh, once you uh, come to know that this is the point I'm unable to reach, then you can go log into that particular device and then you can check that from there, what are the issues. So here also, we should first of all understand the problem is ISP issue or it's a website issue. It's a slowness, a slowness, loss, latency jitter. Likewise, here we can go and 
uh, check is it a authentication issue it's a ap issue it's a uh, uh, wlc issue etc okay so we should know first of all uh, what is the problem once uh, we identify the problem so from problem definition we should identify the problem so we can go and ask questions related to problem definition and we should uh, finally uh, know that what's the problem then we can go and do the testing now the testing means that we should have the basic sets of command so basic set of command uh, related to the basic troubleshooting once we do the basic set of once we run the basic set of command then we should go and analyze that in depth and then we can move to the solution now here again you can see that the analysis phase again uh, we have chance with our questions and with our analysis to redefine the problem statement okay so finding the problem is 50 percent to solve the problem that's the thing if you know the exact problem where is the problem that is the 50 percent of the solution uh, for any type of uh, troubleshooting all right so define the problem understand the uh, possible triggers uh, know the expected behavior if we are able to reproduce it do not jump to the conclusion uh, initially understand the client state we know that uh, if we are uh, using the bottom to top approach so what is the state of client means the state of the machine who is connecting with ap so is the application slowness uh, are they are getting some uh, ip address or flap in ip address or they are not getting any ip address uh, do any problem with the authentication are they able not are and they are not able to see the ssid or maybe ssid uh, strength or the signal strength is uh, very slow or less so those things should be added and this these things should go inside the uh, questions so what you are doing that you are going and asking that these questions what exactly you are facing so for example application slowness that means you have done the uh, authentication you have the ip address you have the rf health you you can see the ssid again application slowness can map to the rf health also so if you have weak length uh, weak signal um, then maybe the slowness of the application correct so we need to understand here you can see this chart that problem then questions and while you are doing the analysis again redefine the problem that is the important key we have so let's know where is the process the client is currently at key item to know for the affected troubleshooting needed to narrow down your problem scope that's the key narrow down your problem the controller keeps client uh, state for all connected clients some items handle on the ap only probes authentication etc we know this thing that you know, uh, these are the touch points so you should know the touch point narrow down the problem reach out what exactly at which particular point the problem is there and then solve it so now again you can see uh, that again if you go and break out this so at what level so we are going from the say for example if i start from top to bottom so that means we are going from actually this is bottom to top so suppose i have client and then uh, once i have the client obviously this client is connected with uh, ap so here you can see the ap related things that we can go and list so listen for the beacons that the uh, uh, th these are again related to clients correct so you can go and list out these informations so you're listening for the beacons uh, the client can request probe uh, then they will get the response the authentication request authentication response here your authentication will go complete now again uh, we are going to discuss more about authentication in upcoming section in the security section so where we'll go and learn about various ways of authentication and security feature inside wireless uh, so yeah so you you are listening uh, then you are sending the probe and then the authentication is happening that's the unauthenticated unassociated so client want to uh, associate with the ap 
that's the uh, process or that's the phase then it's state two where you have authenticated unassociated so you are getting the network that says SSID. you click to the uh, join button you want to join it and then uh, your uh, password is working so that means you are authenticated but still you are unassociated so what we can do association request association response uh, EAP over LAN authentication uh, encrypt the data forward user data so these are the 10 steps that you'll find that you have issue related to beacon proof authentication association or any type of authentication in between the user and the uh, radius server end-to-end -end authentication next was the connection process so we have discussed about this process earlier in the last slide uh, probe you're sending the probe then you're getting the response uh, you're sending the uh, association remember authentication and then association then uh, you can see that we have this process of 802.1x authentication uh, we are going to discuss this in the security section more about the authentication and the security then exchange of encryption keys dhcp and then finally you will move to the run state we know this is the final state run state where each and everything is working perfectly now again uh, if you want to know all the states more and more so we have the policy enforcement module uh, that's the PIM in short inside the uh, inside the split Mac architecture the start till run so here you can see step number one till the last step the start so one two three four five six seven eight is eight states we have and if it is in run state that means everything is working fine so uh, initial start of the client authentication check uh, 8021x uh, that is again dot 1x uh, requirement l2 authentication completed whip if you have the whip key we'll discuss about security uh, later on then dhcp request web auth request and finally in the run state so in between you may have any issue that you have to detect at exactly what point you have issue and then uh, you have to solve it this is the final flow chart here you can see on your uh, screen that is start check the authentication then uh, dot one x uh, required then your l2 is completed if it is not authentication failure if it is then you will go and move to the whip required web should be 100 percent su successful then you will go and move to the next step next step here you can see that you have the dhcp required again dhcp required then you have web required uh, web auth required if it is fail again it will go and stop so likewise you can see the complete chart here where you have l2 policy dot one x web required a zero to one x uh, open ssid mobility DHCPR web keys and again if you don't have any dot one x then it will go to the run state so uh, it will go and complete the steps Say for example it can go like this this and this to reach to the run state so it doesn't mean that always I have all the policy and it will go and across all the 20 steps or all the steps that we are seeing here but yeah these are the steps and these are the touch points where we should go and examine and try to resolve in between that okay so this is the troubleshooting uh, option and how we can go and define and do the define the problem and uh, do the solution so narrow down the problem reach to the nearby touch point go there and try to check exactly which te uh, technology the problem belongs to and then try to resolve it let us understand the basics of wireless network security and even the first place that why this basic networking uh, security we need what's the actual need of the security that's the main thing now what is happening whenever we have the wireless network we know that it is broadcasting its network and that's nothing but the SSID anyone 
who knows that particular secret key he can join that and once he can join then he can go and sniff the other users in the network so somehow again you can see here that if someone is capturing the uh, data or capturing the packet in between the user or in between the client and the transmitter that is nothing but the ap then he can take the role and he can go and connect to the ap that's the one use case we have although there are other use cases as well that someone can hinder the client someone can do some sort of toss attack etc so threat is open because once you are in the open air threat is there now how to reduce this that's the one important question we have and what are the methodologies we have that we are going to see one by one so one of the method could be that whenever you are getting the network you should do the authentication with the access point so you can tell okay uh, i am this and are you looking for this or do you have the database in yourself with my credentials if yes then okay you can go and connect with the ssid now there are option that your database is something called secure database and it is a store somewhere maybe in the active directory or maybe in some secure server that is the one use case that you have now in this case uh, when you are doing the authentication still you should not go and do the authentication in plain text so there are chance that man in middle attack will happen someone will, will go and intercept your uh, intercept your com communication and can get the user id or password or maybe someone can uh, can come with the same ssid near to you and then you think oh he has the same username password etc etc and then you can connect with that ap at the moment you connect that ap you start communication you will be hacked correct so chances are there someone can uh, spoof someone can uh, do some sort of denial of service attack someone can intercept and get the messages because again everything is happening in the open air so what we can do to protect from that we have option we can go for message privacy message integrity and intuition protection at least these things we have and again in upcoming section we'll learn more about uh, privacy authentication uh, privacy integration and protection okay all right so privacy means that we are going to use some sort of uh, encryption and when we are talking about encryption that means when i am sending my password then that password is in some uh, encrypted form so if someone try to intercept the communication he will not get the key that what i have if it is a symmetric encryption obviously uh, both side one side you are doing lock other side will go and unlock it same key in reverse direction they can go and use to open it that's the one thing second thing is integrating uh, integrity and that will be achieved by some sort of uh, authentication some sort of actually message digest keys are there so what is happening in this that your packet so whenever you are sending your packet with encrypted key but you still what you are doing that on top of that you can go and put some sort of mechanism uh, you can think uh, as for this example that you are going to use message integrity check mic that is some sort of a stamp and you will send it now other side he will go other side who is getting that packet will go open that and again if we formulate the same stamp same thing or same algorithm they will also run and if they get the same output that means this client is legitimate and accept the communication or accept the username password okay so that's the integrity and that's the very much same thing that we are using in vpn as well so in vpn also we are uh, using this message privacy that's the encryption we are using the hashed actually hashed value like md5 etc in the uh, vpn as well the third option we have is the uh, intuition protection 
again whenever we are talking about intuition protection at that time we are dealing with the uh, anomaly we are dealing with the signature we are dealing with some sort of deviation in the normal behavior correct so that means that uh, if you have some known behavior and that is not detected some anomaly is there or if you have some sort of signatures signatures are again any type of protocol and they have some format in terms of signature or they are actually written in the signature so suppose this ttp or https those protocols if there is deviation if there is some uh, boosted or you can say that uh, some sort of uh, disformation inside the signature remember uh, what firewall is doing it's a perimeter it will check source ip destination ip etc etc it will not go deep inside the application and check oh this application up to this point it was okay after that there is some virus there is some malicious code etc so it can go deep uh, up to 17 different type of signature that the wireless uh, wlc can detect and then it can take action like the ids are doing now here you can see that the security threat threat if we go and categorize so we may have a threat with rogue devices ad hoc network client association de association problem active or passive attacks like uh, dos and etc those attacks now what is rogue device some device which is in your network and who is going to connect it with your wired network somehow so our WLC has capability that they can detect the rogue devices as well. So they can discover actually uh, both the devices. Okay. So these are the challenges we have and these are the uh, theoretical options for the security. Later on we'll go and check that what type of uh, protection mechanism we have inside the wireless network. Hi there, thanks for your enrollment. We are in one minute ad break. In this break, I'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount. Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then, my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new, like STVAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go, continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses, and study well. All the best. Let us understand the wireless client authentication method. And what type of methods we have, we'll go and check in the upcoming sessions as well. Now we know that AP is broadcasting its network, that's the SSID. There are two fold. One is that we have open authentication and we have WEP. Now, what is open authentication? And you may have seen this thing. So, for example, in the uh, coffee shops or maybe in the airport, that if you go and open your mobile phone or your laptop, you will find that you are getting some network. But if you check that network, you will find that it is pointing that, okay, this although this network is there, but it is unsecure. And if you go and click there, and if you try to join the network, then it will redirect you towards some sort of web authentication. Means one web page will get open where you have to put the username and password, and then you will get the access to that particular network. 
Now this is the example related to open authentication. Now the second example we have here is related to WEP WEP wired equivalent privacy. Now in this case we are using the encryption bit. Uh, here you can see that we have the RC4 as a cipher algorithm and we are using the uh, encryption and that encryption is for example uh, symmetric encryption means encryption decryption decryption encryption uh, web is known for shared key uh, security method and the key length for web is here you can see that will be in between 40 to 104 bits okay so that that's still okay that uh, you are using wp wep as a authentication method but still there are problem so what problem you have that at this point of time when you are doing the authentication uh, with say for example with ap and then say, say for example authentication happen and then what about authorization means you have done the authentication and then you have the full access to the network or anyone has the full access to the network so we are still away from the methodology where we can authenticate with the network device and then that network device will go behind the scene in the back will authenticate with the secure server secure database and from that database some sort of authorization piece will come and then my network device will be will get the authority to access the network or whatever network access you want to do Okay, so still we are away uh, with uh, open authentication and web and that's why uh, Cisco and other vendors they have introduced EAP EAP as name suggests that is the extensible authentication protocol and Why Cisco and other vendors had choose EAP ex uh, extensible authentication protocol is because of its extent uh, extensibility and already this protocol is used in the wired realm so wired network they are using EAP, and it's a common standard EAP 802.1x we used to have that but in wireless also we can use the EAP. so how EAP is working to understand EAP uh, better and properly we should understand these three terms so the user is the supplicant or the end machine is the supplicant then you have the authenticator so for example WLC in our case and then we have the authentication server that may be integrated with the uh, local database or the external database it's up to the use case correct so what this EAP is going to do here you can see that the client uses open authentication to associate with AP and then the actual client authentication process occurs at a dedicated authentication server so what is happening here that first of all client will go and authenticate so your supplicant will go and do the authentication with the uh, network devices these are NAD or NAS so you have first level of authentication here but is still you are not authorized to do everything in the network so in between this WLC and the radius uh, server or uh, authentication server we have radius protocol going on in between okay so the exchange of the access so again uh, WLC will bypass those user credential to the ACS or the I server or any type of server who is going to do the authentication and then the authority things will come and then uh, the supplicant or the user will be authoritative for that particular network access correct so that's the common term we have and the common standard we have that 802.1x using the EAP framework so what we are going to do now that in next section we'll go and study that what different type of EAP methodologies we have in the wireless network. Let us learn about wireless authentication method. Now we know that WEP uh, was started 
and most of this uh, hardware at that point of time was supporting WEP based uh, authentication methodology. But we know that what's the problem with WEP? It, it do not have powerful encryption method. It is using RC4 and again the the length of the bit encryption bit is small. So then Cisco has introduced some uh, some more uh, secured authentication method that is the LEAP leap lightweight um, EAP. Now in this case what is happening that the authentication server and client uh, they are sending their username and password and they are doing some sort of mutual authentication. Now after some point of time it was found that there is problem with LEAP and it is recommended do not use this. Okay, so the industry then they move to new uh, authentication method and that new authentication method is say for example EAP fast EAP fast and this fast stand for EAP flexible authentication by secure tunnel method. Now at this point of time actually the actual secure authentication method has been introduced and at this point of time you will find that now we have the concept of inner and outer tunnel. So you have some sort of outer tunnel and then in uh, after that you have the inner tunnel. You have two type of authentication or you can see that twice you have on the authentication the external and the internal. Okay. So now when we are talking about if fast at that time uh, Actually, again, you will come to know in the upcoming uh, authentication method is that we have something called PAC file. PAC stands for protected access credentials. And it's something like dynamic that all the client should have that PAC file. And that is again to access the uh, network that will be authenticated from any of the uh, secure server or any of the uh, identity services or servers correct now what is happening in efast is that we have phase one here you can see clearly that we have phase zero one and two in phase zero the package generated or provisioned and installed on the client so all the clients they have the pack correct phase one after supplicant we know who is the supplicant after supplicant and as authentication server say for example ice so after the supplicant and ICE have authenticated each other. They negotiate a TLS. So they are going to form a transport layer security TLS who supplicant and authentication server in phase two. Now in phase two you can see this is nothing but the outer TLS and then you have phase two where the end user can be authenticated through TLS for additional security. That is nothing but the inner tunnel. Okay, so here you can see in the notes that we have two separate authentication process one between the AS and supplicant and another within the end users. Now these occurs in a nested fashion. Okay, and uh, again here you can see that one is the outside tunnel and the inner tunnel inside the TLS tunnel. Now what are the key components we have with the pack? So pack has three component one is pack key up to 32 octet key used to establish the tunnel. Then we have the pack OPEC inside that uh, it contains the credentials. And finally we have the pack info uh, inside pack user. We have the key lifetime and a variable length field that used to pass the information over the uh, pack who is going to issue that. So pack issuer and the uh, lifetime we have correct. So remember the key thing here is three phases because in all upcoming and whatever we are using at this point of time the authentication method with wireless technology they are using the same type of methodology that has been used here. Okay, so next again uh, you will see the evolution of the authentication. So we have e fast and then we have peep peep is protect uh, protected EAP. Everything is going to the same. The only thing that we are going to use here is that uh, we are going to use the certification process. So AS authentication server or ICE 
presents a digital certificate to authenticate itself with the supplicant in the outer authentic authentication remember outer and inner so outer uh, authentication they are going to use the certificate and then they will form the tls and then the inner authentication will happen and that's the key outer and inner and these are the phases we have so in phase zero what will happen that whenever the outer actually in phase one so actually with help of ca certificate authority uh, the certification process will happen and then the outer tls will get formed correct now here you can notice that only the as has the certificate for peep in this case the client does not uh, have or use a certificate of its own so it must be authenticated within the tls channel using one of the following methods so we have ms chap version 2 that is microsoft challenge authentication protocol and gtc generic token card a hardware device that generates otp for the users or manually generated password correct so remember everything is same that now you have the certificate and then you have the tls channel now the next uh, and the most secure version of the authentication we have is the EAP TLS. Okay, now what is happening in this EAP TLS? So here you can see that when we have the EAP TLS, in that case again we have the uh, certificate. Now in this case, we are going to use certificate everywhere. So the difference here is that EAP. TLS transport layer security goes one step further by requiring certificate on the AS and on every client device. Now, if you have thousands of thousands of client, that may be a complex solution that you are going to have the certificate to all the client. So there should be some optimization method to do that. Yes, we have that. So EAP TLS is considered to be the most secure wireless authentication method first thing and uh, since you have the certificate to the uh, say authentication server and the client so you should have some sort of uh, public key infrastructure so someone has to manage the certificate for the server and the client so the complexity will get reduced but yeah EAP TLS is the most uh, secure method we have and there may be chances that few of the hardware who is not supporting EAP TLS so in that case we can go one step back and we can use PEEP but most of the places you'll find and in the secure IT infrastructure you will find that EAP TLS is being used since we understand the authentication method uh, now let's understand the integrity method as well so we have wireless privacy and integrity method starting with WEP we know that WEP has been compromised and it's not longer in use means it's not recommended to use at the same time with the same hardware that WEP was using a TKIP uh, was evolved a TKIP is nothing but a temporal key integrity protocol now if you see here the difference between WEP and TKIP it will find that TKIP has better algorithm higher bit in uh, encryption and it is actually much more secure than WEP but still uh, we found that after a certain point of time uh, there are some vulnerability inside TKIP and then we move to other methodology here you can see that what are the methods and why the TKIP is better than web because it is using MIC we know this is something like message uh, integrity check so it will check the integrity of message it has timestamp it has the sender's MAC address it has the sequence number it has the stronger algorithm than WEP and it can do the uh, initialization of the vector so these things are there added content inside the TKIP to make it secure but still we found that uh, even the TKIP is also de uh, deprecated in 2012 
and then we have the new standard and still we are using that standard that is WPA WPA2 and now we have three as well so with the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, as per IEEE 802.11 we have a new standard for encryption and these standard we'll see that why it is so popular and why it is very secure when we'll go and check the contents that what ex uh, exactly they are carrying I will find that so I have one table where you can see the comparison between WPA and WPA2 you can see that uh, WPA is using pre-shared or 802.1x as an authentication and WPA2 is also using the same so the point here is that they are compatible with 802.1x that is the authentication mechanism now when it is coming to encryption uh, is still WPA supporting TKIP but recommended that we should use AES advanced encryption standard with CCMP protocol that is again cipher block chaining message authentication code protocol uh, the point here is that it is providing uncrackable encryption it's almost impossible to crack AES uh, and AES again has different bit set like 128, 192, 256, 256 is the uh, tightest one to crack even uh, don't know that any machine or compute system is there to crack uh, this much of encryption this much of heavy encryption and then finally key management is happening where the uh, dynamic key management in both the case correct so here you can see the specification for WPA and WPA2 the good thing is that WPA and WPA2 that they are compatible with EAP different type of methods like EAP TLS, PEEP, EAP TTLS etc uh, one thing you notice here that in the table that WPA is supporting TKIP as well and that is deprecated so it's recommended that we should use AES CCPM again in the wireless deployment model we have two mode for WPA personal mode and enterprise mode we should go and use enterprise mode obviously in the enterprise network and the enterprise mode they are supporting 802.1x EAP based authentication and plus we know that the encryption is also there okay so now we understand that uh, the authentication methodology and now we understand that the encryption methodology as well so in next section we will go and do the configuration uh, related to WLC we will see the configuration at least that how and where you can go and check these options and again uh, how we can go and uh, configure and deploy over WLC Hi there, thanks for your enrollment. We are in one minute ad break. In this break, I'm going to show you that I have so many courses uploaded over Udemy. And if you're going to enroll my courses, you will get 95% discount. Every month, three times. First week, mid of the month, and the last week of the month. I am sharing the coupons. If you go and use those coupons, then, my courses related to CCNP, related to CCI, all those courses you are going to get heavy discount up to 95%. You can see the prices are a uh, little bit higher here, but if you go and apply the coupon, the prices will go rock bottom. So go use those coupons. Suppose if you don't have those coupons, then you can always uh, ping me over YouTube, you can send me email, you can ask for those coupons, I will provide you that coupon. So get the coupon, get the discount. Some of my courses over Udemy, they are bestseller. Some of the courses are quite new like SD-WAN automation, DNA automation, a CCI data center 3.0. Those are the new uploads as well. So please go continue your learning, take the coupon, enroll my courses and study well. All the best. Next, we have wireless deployment. Now, while we are doing the wireless deployment, at that time, we have option 
what options we have with the wireless. Either the AP is running in the autonomous mode. So we have say a standalone AP, traffic centralized at controller, that is the centralized mode. We have flex control where the APs, they have the local intelligency. We have converged access, that is traffic distributed to the switch. So these options we have for the deployment mode. In all the cases, first of all, we need to attach the device to the ICE. What does it mean by attachment? Means you need network devices and here I am adding my WLC. Likewise, you can add your switch, your ASA, your routers like that. So here you have the list of devices, but important thing that you are giving the radius Protocol as a radius and password, whatever you want to give, you can give. The same uh, password you have to give here as well. That means both sides, so here in the WLC controller dashboard, inside the security, I'll go inside the security and then I'll give the shared secret, confirm that. So both the places I am giving the radius protocol and the shared secret password. So once this is done, because you can see here radius and then authentication. So once it is done, then we can do the rest of the configuration and we can do the deployment. So here you can see, suppose if I have wireless LAN and this is again a good thing. So if you go and create your wireless LAN, say for example, here is employee 13. Once you create that WLAN, you'll get option you want to create yes once you give the this name then you'll get this page once you are inside this page you can do the general setting security qs policy mapping advanced now here the status should be enabled you have to check this thing because this will be disabled or this will not check so enable this first of all then broadcast say for example ssid enable nas id wlc Okay, no problem on that. Then we'll go to the security. In security, you will get various options. What options you have? Either you want to use WPA, WPA plus WPA2. So if you enable this feature, then you will get features related to AES. Once you enable AES, means combination of all these features, then you will get 8021X uh, CCKM plus you can get pre-shared key and then you can give your key the same key when the laptop will join the this particular WLAN say employee P13 at that time you have to give that same key in this laptop whenever you are adding with the wireless SSID okay so you have various options related to security if you want to use 8021x you can use like this Security, if you want, you can, it's not recommended, but you can disable for the MAB guest user, you have to use like this. Okay. Now, uh, in the security itself, we are giving the authentication server, accounting server. So for authentication and accounting, you can see I'm using 1812 and 1813. Otherwise, 1645 and 46 is the default port numbers but we are giving 12 and 13. okay so these are the configuration that we have to do if we are using say gui then in the graphical interface it will be very easy only thing that you have to know where i have to go and which option i need to choose all right so we'll do we'll give all those options and in the advance, this advance is also very important. In advance, you can go and you can check mark here the Flex Connect. If your deployment is Flex Connect, means you are go going to give the intelligence to the local AP. You can enable that. Apart from that, you can see that we can give AAA override, apply radius server return attribute uh, to clients, say VLAN, SEL, QS. And then we have NAC state radius NAC when a client associate to controller on a radius NAC enable WLAN the controller forward the request to the 
eyes so these options we have plus obviously you have the option for the flex connect as well in the same advanced feature you will get that option okay now for the NAT setting to enable device sensor, what settings you want to do? So in the switch, you can give device sensor accounting, device sensor notify all changes. In the wireless device, you can uh, do the client profiling like DHCP profiling on, HTTP profiling on, WLAN, SSID advanced, we'll see that. So for profiling also, you can create the profile. So these all are very important options we have. And uh, once you do all the setting that we have discussed, so here you can see finally you have one uh, WLAN name employee that is done. Then my user can go and simply connect this. Okay. Even if you want, you can go to the eyes say policy policy element condense authorize simple condition and if you want you can set the condition as well for employee ssid all right so everything is done now the client will connect so here i have my client uh, he will use the employee say p13 and because this is 8021x so he has to give a username password he'll connect once uh, he will connect, then ICE will authorize this. Once ICE will authorize this, he can use the internet. Okay. Here you can see in the advanced, you can give the flex connect as well. If you do the flex connect, then what difference with uh, respect to flex connect and without flex connect? I'll show you that. So if you are using flex connect authentication, say in this centralized auth. So here you can see that local switching is on local auth is disabled that means i am using centralized auth that means that i am giving my request to wlc wlc is forwarding to ice and then i am using the internet okay so local switching on auth success but if you use the local auth at that time the ap is requesting for the auth once it is doing this, then it is doing the local switching. You can do your, you can serve the internet. So that's the important difference between, obviously centralized means everything will be done by the controller. And if you have local authentication, if you have local intelligency, that means the AP should take decision on that. So what's the final configuration we have for the conference access wireless NAC? Obviously, you have to give AAA plus radius configuration plus you have to give wireless mobility, wireless management interface, wireless client. Then say WLAN, Cisco TrustSec if you are using some sort of tagging. AAA override, client VLAN, say 30. No shutdown, AP group, default group. So these are the commands you can give via CLI as well. Even we have option via GUI as well. And here I have uh, 36503850 uh, using use for these uh, AP controlling. Okay. So these are the important things for the wireless deployment. And I hope you understand all these steps.